So, um, my name is uh, Hans Christian. I'm a platform engineer at a company called NAV, or a government organization called NAV. <laughs> I just uh, left Bergen today, uh, so I actually had to wake up before my kids, and that never happens. <laughs> They're always the first, so it was really in the middle of night. Um, apart from really, really also uh, loving to work with uh, this cloud native technology here. I really enjoy the outdoors and been working in a tracking association previously. And this was actually from my plane uh, leaving Bergen for Amsterdam. So you can see the wonderful Western Norway <laughs> and, and the sunrise there. Um, so uh, what is this NAV thing? Well, it's the Norwegian Labour and Welfare Administration. It's a mouthful, so I'll just stick to NAV <laughs> because I, I always mess that up. Um, and it's sort of the axle in the Norwegian Welfare Society. So we help um, our citizens all through all the paces of their life. So beginning of when you get born, you get child benefit, uh, you get parental benefits, you get, and when you get older and you might be sick, you get uh, sickness and unemployment benefits. And we have disability benefits and ultimately uh, retirement pension. So all through life, NAV is there and it's the, sort of the basis of the welfare, uh, welfare system in Norway. So I'll talk a little bit about not, and I realized later when I flew, oh, it says legacy platform security. I'm not talking about legacy platform security. <laughs> I will be talking a little bit about our legacy and where we come from. I will then talk about our platform and platform engineering at NAV. And then of course, how we secure, make it all secure. Because in a galaxy, not that far away, um, this was how NAV looked. And uh, I bet most of you that are working in companies that are more than just two years old, they will have sort of experienced some, some similar here. Uh, it was very monolithic. It was this walled garden. It was this village. We have these outer walls to keep all of the dangerous animals on the outside and everything was nice and peaceful on the inside at our village. Very few dependencies, very yearly releases. I were told stories that you had, you came in on a weekend, once in a year or once in a quarter, and you actually stood in line to get your things deployed. And if someone before you, if their deployment failed, you just had to go home. Let's try again next quarter because there was so much mess to clean up. And of course, it was physical servers, um, and, and we still have some of those servers. <laughs> we do have mainframes still. We are still working our way to, through all of the legacy. And the organization looked something like this. We had sort of like NAV, the sort of the overall organization. And then we had NAV IT, and they didn't really talk that much together. It was sort of like, go make this, do this, we order that. <laughs> and NAV IT would just like, okay, <laughs> if you say so. And they would just then hand out contracts to subcontractors. There weren't really any uh, employed, empl uh, at least not developers, there were lots of architects and, and product managers at NAV IT. And of course, you sort of, this percent, this, this makes some challenges. Of course, it was really costly to organize it this way. It was very manual, everything was manual under the sun, and because bureaucracy, we have to have this manual, this needs to be people in the loop all the times. It was really error prone. Um, go figure, and that's why you're sort of like, let's go as slow as we can, because then there will be l less errors. And of course, you had this sort of like disengagement from all around, that people weren't incentivized to actually, oh, I can, I can really get out my best hair and do my best work. That wasn't really what it was geared around. Then something changed. Uh, in 2015, we got new, a new director of NAV and a new director of IT. Okay, so far so good, that was really. And they actually decided that, guess what? We are going to change this, we are going to hire developers. <laughs> so they start, actually then started hiring developers. And in 2017, we started our own Kubernetes cluster 
on-premise because we had gotten some really, really good talent that were doing Kubernetes and doing really cool stuff from some private up-and-coming uh, companies in Norway. And they really, really kick-started and let's do this. And they got much people uh, together, rallied behind them in order to sort of, oh, we can, we can really fix now. We can fix the Norwegian welfare and we can make. And this graph here, which is sort of the bar here, are the average weekly deploys per year. So you can see it takes some years, but then things really, really start to skyrocket. And apparently there's been lots of things going on in 2022, and now it's going a little bit down. I think we are sort of plateauing, and this is sort of the, the peak here. There was a lot of due during the pandemic for NAV. <clears throat> so what we ended up with very, very early on um, was this custom operator. We call it our NICE. The platform is called NICE, and the operator is called NICERATOR. And you can see here, it's quite basic. I presume that all of you know your ins and outs of Kubernetes and really loves and breathes YAML. <laughs> so it isn't really fancy here. Uh, it's just an application. It takes an image and then it takes a thousand and one <laughs> parameters <laughs> that I have omitted. There are optionals, of course. And, and of course, what you get here is your deployment, your services, your ingress service account, network policy, and custom resource, because guess what? These things are implementation details. We can't expect our developers to care about these things. If they want to do, great, you should be able to, but you don't need to, because as an application developer, you should be more focused on actually making the services that your customers, your end users are going to use and not sort of what's underneath here. Why do I need this deployment? Why do I need to know all of these resource manifest specifications here? In this case, they only needed one manifest to rule them all, <laughs> or nice.yaml. So actually, it's not only one operator at this point. We actually have 12 because we got to love those operators and it's so easy with the QBuilder project. Um, so you can scan the QR code here and it takes you to our GitHub repository. All of these are open sourced and some of them are actually used outside of NAV and that's the goal here in order to give back and really sort of make sure that we don't reinvent the wheel over and over again. And we are starting to sort of see that turning more and more, at least in public sector in Norway. <clears throat> so our nice V1 version of the platform, this should really, it, there's nothing fancy here really. You have developers working in Git, we have CI CD, and it sort of deploys our, your NICE application to our NICE -erator. It sets up your application as how you would expect it to be um, without you knowing or needing to know much about Kubernetes. And all of this was done on premise because there's a huge, there's a long tail and long, lots of red tape in order to sort of get out of on-prem and onto cloud and, and doing. So let's start here. We can actually start modernizing and start improving from day one without actually needing to do all of those exercises at once. So we actually got to start modernizing and containerizing. We have um, uh, Grafana and Prometheus, uh, so the, the um, Previous speaker mentioned sort of a centralized Prometheus that calls out to, no, centralized Grafana that calls out to, to all of the different Prometheuses. We have the same setup there, so that was nice to see. Um, and then you have your users going through our big IP FM load balancer to our on-premise environment, and it talks with some um, legacy or <laughs> old database system that we would like to modernize as well. But let's, we started one place and really got people excited and got the sort of deployment frequency going from there and actually got to modernize, got to update these applications. But we didn't stop there, of course. We needed, in order to actually get the ball going here, we needed to get out of our data centers and onto public cloud because that, that let's be honest, our job isn't to run Kubernetes. Our job isn't to run databases. Our job is to provide welfare systems to, to, to all of Norway. But we had some requirements. Of course, going, leaving our data center, leaving our walled garden, that was really punctured at that time. We 
said that let's let's go away from sort of the tired uh, uh, so three tire three tire architecture. We need to go zero trust. We need to have mutual and, and transparent encryption. We need to have policy automation, and we need to have as much managed services that we don't need to sort of know and secure all of the nitty-gritty details. We need to configure them correctly, of course, but let someone else manage those. So that was sort of our requirements. And going back to our graph here, in 2019, we actually got our first production services running on Google Cloud. So after some deliberation, where are we going to go? At this point, there weren't any uh, public cloud providers directly in Norway. Google had opened a data center in Finland, so that was not that close, not that far. Um, Norwegians are familiar, <laughs> we are sort of friendly with our neighbors. We have our Swedes and Danes and Finns, and Iceland, I guess, uh, is sort of the Scandinavia. And from there on, started to, and you can see the graph is just skyrocketing after that, because then every, all of our developers, oh, we, we want to go to cloud, we want to be part of this as well. And there was a lot of positive engagement there. Of course, we needed, um, as I said, sort of we needed uh, policy and encryption. And at that point, um, we, ha having no experience with, uh, with service mesh, we went with Istio um, and really got to experience all of the pain and all of the frustration with a very, very heavy handed um, service mesh that sort of tries to do everything under the sun. So after some time, we, got something new and much better. And this is our lead uh, developer uh, wrote, and the, the QR code here goes to the blog post where the quote is taken. It has to be said, there is a certain satisfaction in cleaning up after a party that has been going on for too long. <laughs> and I can't agree more. And really the migration was done in just a matter of hours. There weren't days or weeks. They were of course planning ahead, but because we had this operator, we controlled how all of the man downstream manifests are made. We could just make the configuration there, roll it out, and it would progressively redeploy all of the applications. So we, we got sort of a graph dependency and we could see where there were clusters of applications that depended on each other. We redeployed those so they didn't have to ta talk across different service meshes. And in a matter of hours, we had, we had everything over running over on, on Linkerd. Really, really huge, huge success. And, and as I said, the QR code there goes to the, to the blog post where we talk about or writes about that. And there hasn't really been much problems. It was sort of, oh, lots of pr uh, perf uh, performance improvement, less overhead, less worries. Is this related to the service mesh is issues that sort of been non-existent? We did, of course, um, uh, not remember to renew our root certificate one time, and that was a real pain, as sort of the previous Kalina talked about. If you renew, sort of with, when when this root is still valid, you can do a zero downtime deployment. It would just pull in the new, and you're good. But if it's already expired, guess what? You need to restart everything, and we had some downtime due to that. Um, we did see that during really, really heavy load that were really unexpected uh, during the autumn, um, we had some performance issues, or rather we had some request tuning issues that we had to tune, and we haven't really experienced any problem with Linkerd since then. And really, sort of the whole nice application in the cloud, um, well, this is, this is how it looks like. It's really no difference from how the developers uh, deploy their applications to our on-premise environment, except that you get to, to use all of the new, cool, shiny features that otherwise you had to order and you had to wait and it was misconfigured and you had to go back and, and sort of until you finally got what you needed. This would now being finally, it could be automated. So of course, we have the same sort of setup here in Nice V2 or the same base. Um, we implemented Snook for code security scanning initially. We have since gone over to using GitHub um, advanced security features and Dependabot. For our CSCD, we have started implementing Salsa um, for our supply chain security. For our cluster security, we started with OPA 
and since transition to Cubano, well, we, there were really sort of, OPA does a lot of things and it, the bar of actually integrating there was a lot, of higher, a lot higher than with Cubano. So it was sort of, it's not been an easy sort of migration. There's been some quirks there as well, but we feel that it's, it's sort of better suited for the needs that we have with it when it comes to sort of, this is our policy, cluster policies for how containers in our cluster should operate. Um, we, of course, going to a zero trust, uh, we needed to sort of have um, network policies all the way. That wasn't really something that we were, were enforced on our on-premise environment. So, of course, network policies is sort of a, um, can be a pain <laughs> if you have to do them, uh, I wouldn't say manually, but sort of op op operate and work with individual policies. So of course, we extended our NICE application. This is how you sort of, you say that application A should be able to talk with application B, and that application B should be able to receive traffic from application A. Make it simple. And for external traffic, we use something called FQDN network policies. It's an external operator made by Google that sort of make you make the same here. You can say that I want to allow traffic to this host here, regardless of what IP address it, it resolves. And the FQDN network policy will do that. And it actually makes uh, sort of pol uh, network policies um, under the hood. So it's turtles all the way down. So with that, we are this far in our sort of journey here. Of course, the sort of the, one of the main selling point of actually going to cloud was that we were able to then provision uh, external resources. So databases and, and uh, buckets and, and sort of external systems that once were manually provisioned. Again, we extended our nice application manifest. So you could just say that, oh, by the way, I would like some SQL databases, please, because we really want all of our applications to have their own database. We don't want applications to share between. And also, we don't want users to be manually sort of setting up their database, manually setting up their access, etc. All of this should, of course, be done automatically. So again, nice orator to the rescue. And then finally here, sort of securing the traffic on its way in. I sort of mentioned that we had some issues, uh, sort of we got some unexpected traffic this, uh, this spring uh, or the spring of 2022. Um, and back then we hadn't really started sort of, we hadn't sort of DDoS protection at this, that level. Um, we had some on-premise, so we moved that out to to Google Cloud as well with the Cloud Armor DDoS protection. So actually now Google does all of their DDoS protection for us. And when those surges uh, hits, we don't really ma mention that, uh, or we don't really uh, get to feel that. Um, because NAV has a really sort of predictive uh, traffic. We don't have huge sort of uh, organic surges. Uh, it's not that Oh, hopefully people, well, they, the, the one we had was during the pandemic when there were a lot of people that sort of got laid, laid off and, and needed their uh, benefit, benefits to continue. But uh, except from sort of those rare events there, we have, it's, it's not that we are getting organically DDoS, then it's something else that we need to filter out. So having that sort of managed by someone else really sort of takes a lot of burden away from our platform team. So that's really is sort of the, the high level overview here. Of course, there are lots of other <laughs> bits and pieces to dig on into the detail. For instance, sort of using WireGuard for a secure connection from our developers onto our clusters and, uh, and different tidbits there. But I only got so much time. So sort of uh, some nice stats here because sort of, oh, um, this again, um, we didn't really lift and shift all of the applications to onto cloud. That would be a horrible thing to do because we do have a lot of, we do have a lot of um, dependencies on our on-premise environments, and those can't be really lifted to cloud. So it needs to be sort of a conscious move by the teams. So it's they them, that control sort of which environment are they running in, but all of the new and shiny stuff are in the cloud. And you can see here from the graph that we are steadily going over. So we beat the 50% mark 
before summer, we are now at sort of, I believe, 62% of our applications. So a total of 1,000 applications running in cloud and 600 running on our on-premise environment. We haven't sort of set a date for when we will sort of turn off off our oh sorry <laughs> or, or turn off our on-premise environment. Uh, at some point, we I hopefully get to sort of set that cut-off date. Yeah, and we are looking at some new exciting features uh, in uh, sort of moving on um, and summing up sort of what's worked for us, giving the teams autonomy to control their application has really been a game changer and sort of incentivize them to actually caring about doing a good job and actually be able to do a good job. The declarative config all the way has been sort of like this, that has worked. Secure defaults, so they don't really need to care, need, don't need to read and read and read and know all the nitty gritty details in order to get started. And again, making the right way the easy way. And with that, I'm uh, rounding off here. <laughs> so if there are any questions, uh, I believe we have a couple of minutes. We do have a couple of minutes. Thank you. Are there any questions? <laughs> After the applause. All the way, way back. in the back. <laughs> One problem. moment. <laughs> <laughs> hmm? Yeah. Uh, Sonia. Hello, can you hear me? Yep. Cool. So I have a question about this nice thing, like what additional benefits does it have compared to having a base chart, which you use to create for developers an interface, like an YAML file that they control and same declarative way. Is it, are there additional benefits? So I believe the question was sort of, what's the benefit having an operator versus a hub chart, right? Or a base chart? Yeah, a base yep. chart which gets imported and gives you the same thing. Yeah. It, it gives more or less the same, but you, then you, you're sort of in, I've done that before, and you really, really, really need to love YAML, YAML <laughs> in order to make that work. And still sort of, it sort of have some, um, sort of quirks there that if you make a change, the, um, that shouldn't really require the developers to redeploy, they, need, they still need to redeploy their application. Of course, you can automate that in some fashion, but in this case, when we want to make something change here, for instance, going from Linkerd to, no, Istio to Linkerd, we just roll out that as a sort of change in our operator. The operator knows all of the applications currently running in the cluster, and we'll sort of do that migration on its own. Uh, so that's sort of, and, and of course, when we build in that much feature, it sort, of set, it, it sort of goes a little bit without saying that you need a proper programming language, you need proper test suits in order to sort of make that work correctly or having the confidence that when we make changes, we don't break uh, 1,600 applications. All right, thank you. And the next question is, if I need to run that at scale, I, I have 30 environments where I need uh, to run the same application but with different configurations, how, uh, like, I also use Helm or Helm file or something else to template and still get some abstraction out of it. Is it possible to get abstraction with NICE? Well, the, the NICE application is the abstraction there. You can, of course, it use is. GitOps and uh, Flux or Argo. We don't do that. We, in Nav, we have two environments. You have prod and you have non-prod. Okay. Really, uh, so it's not that many, and and applications are typically either deployed to our on-premise environment or the cloud, not both. So typically, an application team will have, and I get the stop mark there, <laughs> will only have okay. two environments that they really need to care about for one application. Thank you very much. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, we have one more. All right, we'll try to do.